Good evening, everyone. My name is Marcus Faltermeyer, and I work for the Americas here in Munich. I'd like to welcome all of you for our exciting event tonight that we organized in cooperation with the U.S. Embassy in Berlin, and where we will take a closer look on the future of the transatlantic relations. For roughly the last 70 years, transatlantic cooperation was at the heart of the success story of the so-called West. Democracy prevailed against communist authoritarianism, capitalism won over communist economies, as the story goes, and its prime protagonists were the US, Europe, and to some degree, Germany. However, in hindsight, the early 90s seem to have been the pinnacle of the history of the transatlantic partnership. Fast forward to the year 2021, we hear an American president in his first speech in Congress state that we need to prove that democracy works. This does not quite sound like a success story to me. China, led by an autocratic government, has become an increasingly aggressive presence, not only in the world economy, but also in the military sphere. And the idea of a closer Russian-Western partnership has been shattered ever since Putin's army invaded the Ukraine. Of course, I'm oversimplifying here for the sake of the argument, but to some, it's understandable that they think that, that, they think that since the early 90s, the transatlantic partnership went downhill. The success of the transatlantic alliance is indeed fragile. The reasons for it, its seeming decline are both internal as well as external, and they have significant ramifications for issues such as democracy's resilience, for trade and economy, for energy and environment, as well as for national security and welfare. In our event tonight, we want to make a diagnosis of where the transatlantic alliance stands and what, it prospects, what its prospects are or should be. I'm very proud that we can present to our audience such an outstanding panel with Corey and Elizabeth from the American Enterprise Institute that will discuss these issues with us. If you want to ask questions to our experts, please either post them in the YouTube chat or send us an email. The address is event at americahouse.de. We will forward the questions to our moderator and you will be heard. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's event. Please welcome with me Matthias Kolb. He has been writing for the political section of the Süddeutsche Zeitung for years, and one of his main areas of interest are the US and the EU. Accordingly, in 2016 and 2012, he covered the US election campaigns live from the US for the Süddeutsche, and now he is the Süddeutsche correspondent in Brussels. Thanks, Matthias, for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marcos, for the kind introduction. I'm very thrilled to moderate this event because I really like America House München. I was born and raised in Munich, so it's always great to at least virtually be in München. And uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to, um, to moderate the discussion with two, uh, two scholars, two experts that I, that I really like. I like their tweets, I like their studies, I like their work. And I want to introduce uh, the two of them to you. We have uh, Corey Shackey who is the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC. And before that, uh, Corey was based in London where she was the Deputy Director General of the International Institute for Strategic Studies known as IISS. And I think that was the first, or like while, while Corey was in, uh, at IISS, I, I found out that she hosted a, a really great podcast that was called Sound Strategic. And that was something that I found very enlightening for my work here in Brussels. And uh, yes, I'm really happy that now I have the chance to, um, to ask some questions as well. Before going to the think tank world, Corey had a really distinguished career in government. She worked at the US State Department, the US Department of Defense and the National Security Council at the White House. And uh, I think also an interesting nugget of information is that in 2008, she was a senior policy advisor uh, when John McCain ran for uh, president. <laughs> and um, our second expert um, who will go first when it comes to the presentation is uh, Elizabeth Pro. She's a residence fellow also at the American Enterprise Institute. And before that, she was also based in London working for another um, world-class think tank. She was a senior research fellow at the Royal United Service Institute, RUSI. Um, yeah, where she focused on uh, modern deterrence, uh, hybrid threats, uh, a lot of the um, really important buzzwords that are, yeah, are going around in the international security uh, debate 
uh, resilience, uh, hybrid threats, uh, gray zone uh, conflicts, all these things. This is a lot what, what Elizabeth deals with. Just um, uh, as a short uh, kind of like outline for, for our audience, uh, Elizabeth will, will start with a short presentation uh, where we are now in uh, the transatlantic relations and how we ended up here, then um, Corey will take over. And then afterwards I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I could ask all the questions for the time we have, but I would try to limit myself to two questions and then uh, the audience can ask all the questions. And just as a reminder that uh, America House is really good at picking up uh, the right time for the right debate, uh, at least here in Brussels, there's a lot of excitement about, uh, I would like to call it kind of like Mr. Biden goes to Europe week which is going to start, I think, on the 10th of June. He will go to the UK first for the G7 summit. Then he will come to Brussels, here where I'm sitting, for the NATO summit. There will be an EU United uh, States of America summit. And uh, I think it's very likely that afterwards um, there will be a summit between uh, the American President Joe Biden and the Russian President Putin, from what I'm hearing, it might be in Switzerland. So I think there's a lot we can discuss. And um, yeah, I'm. Really happy to that. And uh, now I hand over the floor to Elizabeth. Thank you all. It's, it's a pleasure to join you. And uh, I was thinking to myself, uh, as, as I was getting ready, I looked over at my bookshelf behind me because I just happened to have a collection of books called Brüder am Werk. And I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Brüder am Werk, but it was a, an ambitious uh, collection of uh, songbooks for the population that the East German government put out. And uh, so I looked in the first volume of Bruder am Werk, and, and, and as you may imagine, um, the first song is the, the national anthem of the German Democratic Republic. And if, if, uh, if I could see you, I would see you all. I, I'm seeing Matthias, but I won't put you on the spot. But uh, um, so I won't ask you which what you guess is the second hymn in, in this uh, second song in this uh, songbook, but uh, I'll give away the answer. It is the national anthem of the Soviet Union. And maybe if I can show it here, this is what it looks like. And um, the reason I mention that is that the, the, the Soviets, the East Germans were so ambitious, ambitious in, in establishing this, this friendship between uh, the Soviet Union and East, East Germany, and of course the Soviet Union did the same thing in other countries, and they even had these songbooks and, and friendship societies and so forth, and now none of that is left, and um, this summer when it was possible to travel within Europe, I went to see one of my university friends uh, from Vienna, who is now, and has been for many years, um, uh, a teacher at the gymnasium in uh, Radebeul by Dresden, and uh, she teaches uh, Russian and English because back in the day you couldn't study for an English degree, uh, English teaching degree without also doing Russian. So she did Russian and English. Well, they can barely get a Russian class together uh, in any given year. And so I'm saying all of that to highlight that it, the transatlantic relationship with ev which everybody keeps beating up on could be worse because it could be like the Soviet Union, now Russia, completely forgotten despite the most strenuous efforts over um, 40 years and, and maybe a couple of, of, of additional years after that. And so uh, if we look at, at recent uh, events, for example, just a couple of years ago during the most recent US government shutdown, which seems to have happened every couple of years. Anyway, during the most recent one, um, uh, the, there was um, a US military convoy traveling from, uh, from Western part of Germany where where the, the US Army is obviously still based, what, what remains of it was traveling uh, towards the Baltic states through uh, Sachsen-Anhalt. And, and uh, the military convoy decided to make a stop in, I think uh, it was Rudolstadt on its way towards, um, uh, no, it wasn't Rudolstadt, it was um, somewhere in Sachsen-Anhalt, I can't remember with the town number. Anyway, the point is um, that it's decided to make a stop. And, and so, they, what happened at this stop was that people came out and were, were uh, excited that this military convoy stopped. And I must say, uh, this again demonstrates the difference between the US, as, as much as we all like to, to criticize the US, that it, it does demonstrate the difference between the US and the Soviet Union, because back in the day, and I remember when the, Soviet, when the Red Army was still around in, 
that was in, in the Rudolstadt, which was the closest place to where I lived. Um, there was nobody cheering those soldiers on. And in fact, they were not even uh, allowed to, to be seen uh, among the general public because they may not, uh, there may not be uh, expressions of enthusiasm should they be seen among the public. So all this is to say that it could be worse. And in fact, I think we are on, on uh, as, as much as we complain about the German armed forces and, and uh, the, their inability to uh, maybe do what, what uh, the US and others expect of them, um, we could be on the cusp of something really productive and not just because in Germany, uh, there is a fantastic defense uh, minister at the moment who uh, you all know is, who doesn't <laughs> need any further elaboration, but who is very innovative in, in new areas of national security, inc including uh, Dein Jahr for Deutschland. And, and similar innovation are, is happening in, in other NATO member states. And that's what I want to highlight about the transatlantic, transatlantic relationship. I think it's moving from the traditional relationship of, of the US as the anchor of, of traditional security, traditional defense, backed up by the UK, and then in, in sort of a, in, in a uh, in, a, in a nice sort of duckling, uh, row of duckling sort of way, it goes from the biggest to the smallest. And, and at, at the end of that long row are the smallest European countries that don't feel particularly important in traditional defense because they have smaller armed forces. Well, the threats are changing and that's where even smaller countries, uh, starting with Germany, which is not so small, but where they can make a fantastic contribution and are already making a fantastic contribution. For example, your year for Germany. I think it's a model that can be adopted by other countries. It couldn't have been thought up for the, by the US because the US is, has this uh, unfortunate burden of, of being the master of traditional defense. So there's really no need to innovate. It could be uh, what your year for Germany it could be what the Czechs are doing. Uh, by the way, start, um, starting again tomorrow, uh, another gray zone exercise, the first live iteration of something they started in January, uh, exercising um, gray zone threats with our private sectors. It could be something uh, like what uh, the Estonians have done for a number of years, um, volunteer cyber reserves, and that's something that, that France does as well. It could be something uh, like uh, what Sweden does with, um, uh, public awareness campaigns about uh, gray zone threats, um, uh, counter, um, counter disinformation efforts. Uh, all of these initiatives are going on. It's a little bit piecemeal, but the point is that this is, these are initiatives that everybody else in the Alliance can benefit from. And, and so it gives, I think, um, the, the smaller members of the transatlantic relationship um, uh, a little bit of, of, of stardust in a way that hasn't been uh, hasn't been there uh, with traditional defense simply because if you're a small country you will have smaller armed forces and so I uh, I want to leave it at that on that optimistic note and I, I'm I'm sure others may not see it as optimistically but just uh, let me just finish with with uh, a note from a uh, from a recent military conference as you know there is something called uh, called the land warfare conference every year where all the chiefs of European armies and the commander of the US army get together. And I remember a few years ago, um, the, um, one of the army chiefs who shall remain nameless uh, got up and said, uh, for his presentation got up and said, well, I'm told I only have 10 minutes, which means I don't have time for a joke. So I won't tell you about the Bundeswehr. And so I thought that that time is, <laughs> is over. The Bundeswehr can do, uh, uh, can do things that maybe uh, aren't in the traditional area of, of defense, but could be very innovative. And so um, maybe your year for Germany, Dein Jahr for Deutschland, is just the start of that. So over to you. Thank you. Corey, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, and I want to make four points. The first is that the transatlantic relationship isn't newly complicated and difficult. It's always been complicated and difficult. You know, we sometimes mythologize a past in which the United States was reliable and statesmanlike and European allies did what the United States wanted them to. And I'm a historian of NATO and I keep looking for that time and I still can't find it. Um, Dwight Eisenhower in 1956, while a sitting president, uh, 
his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, came back from the NATO foreign ministers meeting and at a meeting of the National Security Council, President Eisenhower, the most Atlanticist president in the last 80 years, um, was agreeing with John Foster Dulles that NATO had run its course and we needed to find a new way of protecting America's interests because Europeans were just not serious about the undertaking of defending themselves. So, and I can think of, good Lord, the Suez crisis, uh, German rearmaments in 1954, the Eisenhower administration had to threaten an agonizing reappraisal of America's commitment to European security if European countries wouldn't agree to German rearmament through the EU. And they didn't. Um, and right, so American influence, even in 1954, was extraordinarily limited. The pipeline crisis of the 1970s, the first Soviet pipeline to West Germany. So the history of NATO is the history of us identifying problems, but the magic of the transatlantic relationship is that none of us have better choices than cooperating with each other. That's what holds us together. That's what gives us the opportunity to think creatively in some of the ways Elizabeth was just outlining. Um, so, so first, my first point is there's never been a magical time when the transatlantic relationship wasn't hard. It's always hard. Um, my second point is that Germany has always been the center of gravity of the transatlantic relationship in the post-war period. You know, Eisenhower during the 1958 Berlin crisis talks about how he's not worried about a war with the Soviet Union. He's worried about Soviet pressure increasing the desire in Germany for neutrality. Um, because he worried that a Germany that wasn't anchored to the West was inherently destabilizing for Europe. And so I think the German question has always been at the center of the transatlantic relationship and it remains so now. I would encourage you if you haven't yet seen a terrific article in a defense website called War on the Rocks by a young German defense analyst, Ulrika Franke. It's an outstanding um, memoir of what it feels like to be a German who has grown up in safety and, and now realizing there are expectations of Germans that Germans of her generation uh, are still grappling with. I, I found it very poignant. Uh, so, so the German question's always been at the center of the transatlantic relationship. My third point is that the genius of the transatlantic relationship, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is that none of us have better choices, right? I started working on transatlantic issues in 1991 uh, and everybody had their hair on fire about the German military being taken out of NATO by the Franco-German Corps. And the European Union was gonna make the United States irrelevant in European security. And we were all wound up about it. Um, and it's the 35th time in NATO history we've had that concern. We fight about burden sharing, we fight about uh, all sorts of things. But the point is, that for the middle and small powers of Europe, having an American security guarantee feels safe in a dangerous world. It even felt safe in the 1990s when the world felt pretty safe to Europeans. Um, and for the United States, being the rule setter and enforcer of the international order is actually really lonely. Um, and it's actually really hard. And so having friends who think we're doing the right thing or who help us get it right when we have it wrong 
is actually a great reassurance and not just to the American government. My mom is likelier to think her government is doing the right thing if our European allies are willing to stand alongside us. Because unlike the Soviet Union, we can't force them to. They have to choose to. And it's a very beautiful thing that the United States' closest friends do choose to stand beside us. That Germany would fight in Afghanistan these last 20 years because of an attack on the United States is an incredibly beautiful gift to give us. And that's the fourth point. These, the transatlantic relationship has a depth of sentimentality that prevents it from being transactional in the way many of our country's relationships with others are transactional. And that's why I'm actually not worried that the rise of China will fracture the transatlantic relationship because the core of common values that are a velvet cord tied from the ribs of the United States to the ribs of our European allies, uh, at the end of the day, there is no escaping that for free societies. And the friction that we have in the transatlantic relationship right now because of Russia and China, well, this is actually consensus in the making for the transatlantic relationship. I noticed that the Biden administration has backed off of sanctions over Nord Stream, uh, which we were overdue to uh, concede to our German allies, given the importance of that to them. And European businesses are starting to have as jaded a view of China as the United States and its Asian allies have of China. And so I don't think we should lack confidence in the convergent force of our common values, whether they are uh, privacy, and we think the distance between us is so big, but wait until you see the other guys, <laughs> or over business, or over uh, civil society issues. Uh, we will still be each other's allies 40 years from now, uh, because until the world becomes completely safe for our interests, we feel safest when we're working together. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think this was a lot of food for thought uh, for, for questions that the audience can ask. And um, I also have uh, two or three questions coming from, from the input that you gave us. And um, Corey, you, you talked about uh, something that was kind of like my first question, Nord Stream 2. I think it was all over the news in Germany today that the president, yeah, kind of like gave that waiver for 90 days. And I think there's a lot of hope in Berlin now that this 90 days chance can be used to kind of like, yeah, build a package, build a compromise to um, that, that the whole, yeah, this, that this issue that is, I think, a really, really big hindrance for the, for the bilateral relations can be kind of like, yeah, uh, can be solved. But um, could you elaborate a little bit more to both of you? What's, what's your take on that? Is it a politically wise decision by President Biden? Does he risk a lot? Because I think Congress is very much against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. They want sanctions. It's not only the Republicans, the Democrats as well. So is it, is it a big risk for President Biden to take the decision? And what do you think does he want in return? What do the Germans have to offer? Mm -hmm. Is there more alignment on the China issue? I think the G7 summit will be a lot about how to deal with China, what's, what's your expectation on that? So uh, my expectation is that the Biden administration is looking for a way out of their initial decision to sanction Germany companies engaged in Nord Stream. Uh, the Biden administration is fundamentally protectionist and opposed to trade agreements. Um, and one of the oddities of that is that the American public is not. If you look at the data on American public attitudes uh, that the Chicago Council on Global Affairs puts together, President Trump's trade policy has reminded Americans how much they favor trade, how much it advantages all parties to trade. Um, and so I think Congress and the administration are lagging public attitudes 
on that. And the second thing is I and a bunch of other people have been uh, hitting the Biden administration on the fact that they keep saying we need allied convergence on all sorts of important issues because we need a common front on China. And yet the Biden administration was demanding compromises of allies and had no evidence of willingness to make compromises themselves. So that's what that's how I take the meaning of the compromise on Nord Stream. They want to show America's closest friends that we understand we're going to ask hard things of you, are asking hard things of you, um, and you have a right to ask them of us as well. And so you're right, President Biden's going to have to twist some arms in Congress. Uh, but that's mainly what the president of the United States job is, is to deliver Congress on things that are sensible for the country. And I guess the last thing I would say is that um, I don't expect there will be an overt American ask of Germany or others. Uh, I wrote a column in the Atlantic maybe six weeks ago arguing that the United States should let Nord Stream be completed and should instead hold hands with Germany, think about how to make uh, Central European countries feel more secure. So move forward in ways that uh, address the legitimate concerns, but also we are underselling how much EU reforms to the energy market in the last 10 years have removed Russia's ability to use energy as a weapon. And we ought to be celebrating that, all of us celebrating that. We took a weapon out of an adversary's hands by the Western superpower, which is regulation. <laughs> Standard setting is a, a great thing. Elizabeth, you want to jump on the Nord Stream 2 issue as well or? Sure. Yes. And uh, so if you ask whether it's a good or bad thing, I think it's, it's, it, it was the only possible uh, decision Biden could take or the Biden administration could take uh, because if you look at, at, at what the sanctions were, it was, unila it was unilateral sanctions against companies that hadn't uh, violated any, any laws. It was just a, a, a geopolitically, well, these were geopolitically motivated sanctions. And, and the result uh, was that, uh, for example, the insurer, one of the insurers then uh, deserted Nord Stream 2 uh, because uh, insure, the insurance sector looks at uh, follow sanctions extremely closely. They don't want to insure companies that are in the sanctions uh, uh, for very obvious reasons. And um, so uh, um, it, that may or may not matter to the US uh, whether uh, Nord Stream's uh, insurers want to insure them or not. But what matters to the US is that other countries can do the same thing. So if the US decides to impose sanctions on, on uh, companies whose operations it doesn't like, then what will happen to American companies if another country doesn't like what they do? And yes, uh, America's allies may not impose, uh, impose sanctions on, on American companies, but what about America's adversaries? And that would leave American companies without insurance, which would uh, in effect mean they couldn't operate. So it, 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 that was bound to happen because America is not going to be the only country in the world that take, reserves the right for itself to impose sanctions on, on, on other countries' companies. And so it was really uh, inevitable that, that uh, Biden would, would take this step or the Biden administration. Perfect, yeah, and I think also this, this week, uh also started with the good news about for the transatlantic, or for those who care about the transatlantic relationship, about this truce, about the steel tariffs. I think just like they're really good signs from what, what Corey said that compromises are, are tried to be found to make it to make it easier, just like yeah, to to leave some of the obstacles or some of the problems from the previous years, uh, sometimes decades, when you think about Airbus and Boeing behind and then move on to something that's that's more relevant for the future. And my my last or like my my last personal question would be because uh, I get a lot of great input from from the audience would be, um, I think, of course, it's no secret that uh, Germans were very much relieved with the outcome of the US presidential election. I think a second term uh, for Donald Trump would have yeah, really kind of like crushed a lot of uh, 
sympathies and trust towards the US that has been still around. But what, what I keep hearing when I talk with people here in Brussels, be it at European Parliament and NATO, um, the European ones or at the commissions or ministers when they pass through is always this, yes, of course we like it when President Biden says, yeah, America is back, but the question is, for how long? Just like, can can the relation really be made a little bit more bulletproof that if uh, either Donald Trump himself comes back for another term or a Trump-like persona can, yeah, can continue in trying to um, to dismantle what, what, what was built in the decades before. Is, is, is that a fair assessment from the European side by your perspective? And do you think that the Biden administration so far is doing enough to, let's say, to make sure that the transatlantic relation yeah, becomes stable again, the trust is being built up, that the institution are made more, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of like bullet, bulletproof um, yeah. in, the, in the four years or eight years, depending how long he will govern? It's a really good question and it's an important question. So I'm glad you asked it, my friend. Um, I share the concerns that, that you described. I would point out though that you know, the American political system is tied so tightly to our public that our presidential elections tend to be pendular swings. We overcorrect for what we didn't like about the last guy. Um, and, uh, and Donald Trump is not yet a spent force in American politics. The craziness going on and I say this as both a conservative as a, and a Republican, the craziness going on in the Republican party right now has not yet run its course. And so our friends are right to be worried. I think though President Biden rightly understands that the best way to bulletproof transatlantic relations is actually to focus on America's domestic problems. I think it's really smart strategy that President Biden is less concerned about what elected Republicans want and more concerned about what Republican rank and file voters want. Um, so for example, the infrastructure package and COVID relief, uh, Republican, Republicans in Congress are voting against those things and their concerns have fallen on deaf ears because they can't deliver their voters in opposition. And President Biden's a good enough politician to understand that the best way to change Republican elected officials behavior uh, is to separate them from their own voters. And I think he's actually doing that really adroitly so far. The other thing that I would say is that I do think my own explanation of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, two more points. One, it is consequential that yesterday the Manhattan District Attorney announced that the investigations into President Trump's business dealings are no longer a civil investigation. They are now a criminal investigation. You could well see the president, former president of the United States go to jail for tax evasion or other business crimes. And that would help defang uh, his public support. Another important decision that's going to be made is gonna be made by private American companies, social media companies determining whether or not to allow him back on their platforms because a lot of the rancor has drained out of American public discourse even just in the last three months because President Trump isn't in a position to broadcast to hundreds of millions of people all of his angry vituperative lies. The last thing I'll say, I'm sorry I went so long on this, Matthias, but I do think it's a really important question. Um, the last thing I would say is that it's a really beautiful thing that America's allies worked so hard to insulate the transatlantic relationship from the damage President Trump intended it in the four years of uh, being the chief executive of the United States. And I very much hope uh, our friends at America House and friends listening to this tonight understand how much Americans appreciate it. And you can see it in public polling of American attitudes. 
in 2016, there was a lot of sympathy for pres then candidate Trump's uh, challenges about why aren't America why why aren't America's allies doing more? And you have seen a nearly 20 point swing in support for America's alliances as a result of Donald Trump's policies. You can see it clearly in Gallup's polling. You can see it in the Chicago Council on Global Affairs that Americans actually like it that our allies are uh, patient with us, are understand we just they need us and we deserve us to be better than we have been during the Trump years. And it's resonating with Americans. Great. Elizabeth, you want to jump in on that one too? Well, what, what can I add to what Corey has just uh, uh, brilliantly explained? Uh, if I could just uh, make the case for the people who actually work to maintain the uh, transatlantic uh, uh, alliance every day, which are the, the, the foot soldiers, both the, the literal foot soldiers and, and the proverbial ones uh, in the armed forces and in the business community. And, and I don't think we pay enough attention to them here in the think tank community. When over the past four years, we all got together and said, why isn't it terrible that the transatlantic relationship is in such poor shape? And while we were doing that, um, soldiers from, uh, from every single NATO state and NATO member state and, and partner state were uh, kept exercising together um, in various European countries. And of course, in, in 2020, Defender Europe Begin, began to, to take off and then of, uh, of course had to be canceled uh, because of COVID. But nevertheless, all of that is happening. And, and uh, on the business side, uh, it's as if uh, Trump never happened, well, apart from, from tariffs and so forth, but, but the, the, the commercial links have kept going. And, and that's, I think, what we can rely on even, even in bad times. Uh, and, and I think it, it behooves us here on the think tank side or on the academic side to, to pay tribute to the, to the, the, the people uh, of all uh, levels, but especially at, at the most junior level or the, the youngest people who make this relationship work every single day. Perfect, yeah, I think that's also something what I learned when I, I was in Brussels for the last two years of the Trump presidency. And I think also just like their, uh, the diplomatic staff working at the US mission, both to NATO, both to European Union, I think it was, a very challenging time for all of them, but I think it was highly appreciated on the European side that there were career diplomats who really tried to, of course, be loyal to, to the administration, but at the same time, who, who knew a lot about the, uh, the transatlantic relationship, who spoke the languages, who moved, who moved abroad to kind of like to keep these, these, these personal connections uh, alive. And then of course, always trying to look for ways that, that you can, uh, yeah, advanced projects that are in both interests and I think for example uh, I think two weeks ago it was announced that the uh, uh, United States can, talk, pay, can, can take part in this military mobility project a very wonky Brussels uh, idea uh, uh, the PESCO project but important. Really important but I think it's really important for um, for EU NATO relationship and others and that was something that we, we journalists learned that that was prepared when Trump was still president because of course there were people uh, in the different uh, ministries in the administration who knew what kind of a big deal it was and so that there was preparation both official and unofficial so that um, yeah when whenever the chance comes something like this could happen so I think it's really um, I really applaud Elizabeth for for the shout out and um, now I can, can, can uh, I, switch can my I role up to Oh, yep. Can I just make one more, more point on, on, on that note? So universities uh, and the EU spend millions of, of euros and dollars every year to send their students abroad for, a, for an exchange program. And uh, on the armed forces side, that exchange program happens on, on its own. It's, it's a side benefit of, of, of all these uh, young people and, and obviously uh, increasingly old people uh, being deployed in other countries. And, and I, I just want to sort of pay tribute to, to that side as well, where you get... Uh, the uh, cultural exchange almost as a side benefit of, of uh, military defense. And, and I can't count the number of people who uh, were either of, of Americans who were either born in Germany or have a, a German mother. It's usually a German mother uh, because uh, their father met a, a German girlfriend when he served in Germany and, 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 and so forth. And just the other day I had coffee with a little, well, somebody who I knew when he was 10 years old. He is now no longer 10 years old. He is um, 
he is a helicopter, helicopter pilot in the US Army, and he told me that he had applied for, a, he has applied to uh, be stationed in Germany, but he didn't have very high hopes that he would get one of those slots because they're extremely attractive. And instead, he thinks it'd be posted somewhere in the US. A another aspect of the transatlantic relationship. Great, so now I'll switch the role of just like more reading out the great questions that keep pouring in. Uh, the first one is for, for Corey. Um, Dr. Shecky, you said that neither the US nor Europe has better choices. It seems that at least partially the Chinese regime is trying to convince countries by providing medicine and vaccine that they, the Chinese, might be a better choice. At the same time, countries in the European Union are upset that the United States is holding back vaccines. A recent survey from the Spiegel shows that many Germans distrust the US more than China or Russia. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, so I think the best way to uh, get trust is to earn it. I don't think the American president is wrong to prioritize getting American citizens vaccinated first. I think the German chancellor would probably make the same choice because you're responsible first and foremost to your own citizens. But I'm extraordinarily pleased that the Biden administration has already started releasing 60 million vaccines. I think the president announced two days ago, another 20 million are being released. Now that there is adequate supply in the United States, we are pushing out vaccines to, uh, to our friends who are in need because the sentimental underpinning, I mean, it, it breaks Americans' hearts to see Italians and Germans and French and British suffering as we Americans are also suffering. And so the Chinese were smart to be fast with it. If I were a Chinese citizen who hadn't had the opportunity of being vaccinated, I'm not sure I would be wild about my own government prioritizing its foreign relations over the good of its own people. And that's the natural constraint on China proving more trustworthy than other countries, which is authoritarian governments who don't care about the privacy or well-being of, uh, of their own people are never gonna be natural allies for free societies. I mean, just two examples. When the virus broke out in the city of Wuhan, the Chinese government boarded people up in their homes to prevent its spread. Imagine Germany or the United States making that choice. Second, they used their military for vaccine testing without the consent of those soldiers. Again, imagine the Bundeswehr or the American army doing that. Um, so I think as all of our free societies begin to get more informed about the nature of Chinese governance, um, their trustworthiness will come more into question and we will be reminded why as aggravating as the United States is, um, producing reliable vaccines uh, that can help everybody is actually one of our long suits. Great. The next question is for uh, addressed to Elizabeth, but of course, Corey, if you want to jump in, uh, you can you can do that afterwards because it touches a very uh, important issue when it comes to the uh, transatlantic relation. It's the two percent goal, and the question goes. Uh, Ms. Broad, do you think that by focusing on innovative aspects in national security, the German government can circumvent the 2% goal for military spending? And would the US government buy such an argument? <laughs> Famous <laughs> trick question. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I wrote uh, an op-ed with Ben Hodges saying that, that the Germans uh, should get, uh, they should build, um, uh, well, roads uh, and, and uh, highways, um, 
autobahn uh, that were uh, more, well, had better capability for, for transportation of, of uh, military equipment, well, military convoys. And <laughs> the, the reactions we got, and, and, and our point was that that should count towards 2% because it really does help the defense of, of Europe, it would help uh, armed forces, obviously, as, as we all know on this call, armed forces traveling uh, east to west. Uh, and the reactions we got to that uh, article either was, it was on one on one hand, it was, oh, they want to let Germany off the hook again because it's it's much easier to spend on on road construction and in, than it is uh, on 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 uh, on military uh, immediately military capabilities if if you're Germany. And the other reaction was, oh, um, Hitler built uh, Autobahn, so so uh, that would be a terrible idea. And so you can never get it right, apparently. But I, I think it stands to reason that um, that you can fit these new capabilities into two percent, uh, primarily because they are so cheap. <laughs> uh, what what you need to do is is not, you don't you don't need to to buy very much at all. What you need to do is is uh, train uh, the the. The proper way, educate the wider population, educate and work with the private sector. It's it's really extraordinarily uh, cost efficient, and so I don't think that would make or break the two percent goal. And 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 but uh, I think uh, as anybody who has raised a teenager knows, the more you you keep nagging about something, the less likely it is to happen. So maybe we shouldn't mention two percent at all, and then magically uh, German defense spending will go up. Yeah. So I disagree with my friend and colleague Elizabeth on this. Uh, you know, the German government voluntarily accepted this goal of spending by 2022 2% of GDP on defense. All other NATO countries accepted it as well. Um, and uh, the world is feeling dangerous, not safe at the moment. And the Bundeswehr has a lot of investments it needs to be making as Germany's parliamentary investigations into the readiness of the Bundeswehr make clear. Um, so it is no harder for Germany to spend 2% of its GDP on our common defense than it is for Norway or Estonia um, and it's more difficult for many countries that don't have the standard of living Germany does. Um, and so I do think it's fair that Germany, like all other NATO countries, meet that voluntary commitment. That's one of the debates that I'm really interested to see that how play out in the upcoming Bundestagswahlkampf, just because I think uh, during the Trump presidency, it was quite easy to say like, no, 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 we're not going to do that or we do it at a slower pace. I think so far uh, Germany wants to achieve the 2% goal in 2031, just because it could always be blamed that something that Trump forces upon us. And uh, yeah, and I can remember because I also uh, had to write about it several times. And then of course I had to mention Cardiff 2014 that what everybody agreed on. Um, and yeah, the uh, maids by readers were not always, um, yeah, uh, that, make me convinced that I could convince them. Um, but there's, I think, a good, a good follow-up um, that's also still connected uh, to the NATO context. And it goes, the Eastern European members within NATO often have a different approach to national security, focusing more on territorial security. As we've seen only recently in the US with the attack on the colonial pipeline, national security is also a matter of the cyber world. Where do you think the main focus of NATO will be in the future? So I suspect Elizabeth and I may differ a little bit on this, um, which is one of the reasons I'm so glad we are both sharing our perspectives on this panel. Um, in my judgment, we should be feeling grateful that our adversaries have been pushed to the margins of the conflict spectrum because that means they lack confidence they could invade a NATO country successfully. So the first thing is we should celebrate that our hard defense of our territory is what has driven our adversaries to terrorism, to cyber attacks, uh, to the margins of the conflict spectrum. But the second thing is, of course, we also have to succeed at defending our societies at the margins of the conflict spectrum. 
And Elizabeth's outstanding modern deterrence program is an incredible set of experiments and exploration of different ways to do it. So we can't do one or the other. We need to do both of these things. And now that we've identified the nature of the problem, you know, the Cyber Center of Excellence in Estonia, the cooperation among the Five Eyes Intelligence uh, countries, four of whom are NATO members, three, excuse me, three of whom are NATO members, um, that we begin to figure it out. And that's what free societies do. They, they experiment to find ways consistent with public trust for doing things that uh, have durable answers to problems. We have a durable answer to the problem of how do we defend our territories, which is stand shoulder to shoulder in the NATO alliance. And now we need Elizabeth's work to tell us how we're going to solve the rest of the problem. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's my cue. So uh, uh, what happened in the Czech Republic in just the past month, I think, really demonstrated why uh, why it's so important to evolve all of society in, in trying to keep uh, our country is safe. So what happened was obviously that that the uh, Czech um, uh, the Czech government established established that that uh, this explosion at an uh, arms depot had been caused by two uh, Russian intelligence operatives. And uh, then, uh, as we all know, the Czech Republic expelled Russian diplomats, and Russian uh, the Russian government expelled uh, Czech diplomats in turn, essentially leaving the Czech embassy empty. Uh, in, Wash in, in, in Moscow, and, and then uh, the Czech um, government uh, called on its allies to respond, and, and uh, that's where we are at the moment. Um, but the point is that this, this cycle is likely to escalate, and uh, so uh, what does it mean? Uh, it means that Russia can, for example, decide to target Czech, com Czech companies with uh, cyber attacks or other things, and we have seen China um, voice its displeasure with, with certain countries' uh, decision on 5G by saying very publicly that it will punish those countries' companies. And, and it has, in fact, already pun punished some companies. So what does this mean? It, 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 these are things that, that where the armed forces of any given country are, are powerless to do anything. Um, and so it just means that uh, if, if we are to maintain our free and open societies, we have to involve these other parts, meaning the private sector and wider society. And I think that's that's where we have so much potential because we all want to maintain our free and vibrant and open societies. And we don't always have to want, to, we don't always, we don't want to, to ever live under the fear of, oh, maybe uh, maybe our uh, gasoline uh, will run out because some, some, uh, some group somewhere decided to, to um, block our, uh, our main, pipe, main pipeline and demand ransom. So uh, in a sense, I think this can bring uh, the armed forces and, and the rest of society closer together. They shouldn't be combined because, because they should be separate. That's how our societies work. But uh, with, with us all having a role to play so that the armed forces are not some sort of island of, of mysterious action that nobody understands and, and that mo many may not want to put any money into. I, I think this will make us all appreciate how, how uh, incredibly vulnerable and precious our societies are and that everybody does have a role to play, whether you wear a uniform or not. And, and that, that specific role can be uh, extremely limited. It can be just not going to fill up gas in every conceivable container when there is a, a ransomware attack, or it can be going all the way to, to serving a whole career in the armed forces. Great, I think there's another good uh, a question, which is like a really good follow-up to what, what Elizabeth said, uh, because I think that's, yeah, the, the buzzword resilience is just really tackled here. And it's, it, the question goes, in how far do the democratic struggles within the countries of the transatlantic community, such as Trump denying the legitimacy of the presidential election 2020, endanger the national security interests of the US and others? Do you think the instability of democratic governments can be exploited by China, Iran, or others? And if I may add to, do you think that um, 
NATO should also discuss more the problems that some of the NATO members have. I think if you look at Poland, if you look at Hungary, if you look at Turkey, do you think it would be good to tackle these, of course, very thorny and very, very delicate issues within the alliance? Because my impression sitting here in Brussels is that when we uh, remind uh, Secretary General or other people that just like it's, a, it's an alliance of values and whether these problems should be tackled from the inside, then it's more about like, this, yeah, we don't want to talk about it that much. It's more the Europeans that have to deal with the problem in Hungary and, and, and Poland. But do you think that's also something that the NATO leaders or the, the uh, ambassadors in the North Atlantic Council should discuss more openly because we can only gain from that? You know, I don't have a good answer to this. It's a really hard question. And it's not just newly hard because of the backsliding democratically in Hungary and in Poland. It's a longstanding NATO problem. I mean, Turkey, um, Greece was run by the military in the 1970s. Uh, and we've never had a particularly good answer I personally very much like the way Secretary Blinken has approached this in conversations with China. During the first meeting between the US and Chinese in Alaska a couple of months ago, um, Secretary Blinken and the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, were quite open about the genocide occurring at Chinese government hands in Xinjiang um, and uh, about human rights violations more broadly. And the Chinese got very angry, threw back in their face uh, that, you know, uh, American police kill black people. And, uh, and by the way, the Chinese are right. But the difference is Americans can say the Chinese are right, and we need to fix this problem. And if you're Chinese, you don't have that luxury. And I liked the way that um, Secretary Blinken acknowledged the failures of democracy in the United States, the failures of equal justice under law, the failures of civil rights, and said, and yet, that doesn't mean we don't have standing to also point out others' failures and work together with them to improve. Um, and I think that's the closest I can come to a, a way to have a continuing conversation. I think it's important to have the conversation both publicly and privately, but starting from a point of humility, um, because we have a lot to be humble about in this regard, uh, and uh, once China gets up to the American standard of failure, uh, then, then they'll get a lot more resonance for their concerns. Elizabeth? It's so easy to, to, uh, to see our authoritarian neighbors or, or, or rivals as, as all powerful. And uh, if I may just draw a parallel to uh, my favorite country of study, East Germany, it, it too looked incredibly sturdy and it had, it had an organization for everything, uh, including, for example, uh, Kampfgruppen der Arbeiterklasse, which uh, it, 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 theoretically is a, was a fantastic force where essentially every factory, where, I don't even know whether, whether uh, people know what it is anymore, but it, it was a, an organization where essentially every factory worker had a sort of a para paramilitary role in case of conflicts or defense. And, 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 uh, and of course, every other part of society was organized in, 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 uh, in keeping the country safe. But then it crumbled and turns out nobody wanted to defend the country. Nobody wanted to be involved. And, and that's what we have because we want to, to uh, we like our way of life. And, and by the way, the other side likes our way of life too. Nobody likes theirs, or almost nobody likes theirs. And, and I think that's, uh, it's a useful reminder, and, and I think all of us on, on, the, on this call, or at least on, on the screen, were born before 1989, but uh, maybe it's, it's just useful for the generation born after 1989 to, to, um, uh, for them to, to familiarize themselves through school and otherwise with, with 
uh, the incredible uh, tension and, and, and the fact that it was not inevitable for that to happen, which happened. And, and yesterday was uh, 101 years since the birth of, of Pope Paul II. And I think uh, if we look at it today, uh, his visit to Poland in 1979 uh, sounds like or looks just like a, another courtesy visit. <laughs> but uh, uh, for those who experienced it, it was obviously a, a seminal moment. And I, I think it, it, it is useful for us as, as democratic societies. And this goes very far from your question about NATO, but maybe um, I, I think not maybe I know it is connected because it's so easy to forget uh, what a, how close closely we have stood to the brink and how important uh, it is that we all appreciate what we have. And then, uh, yeah, what about Turkey? I think Corey answered that uh, uh, brilliantly. So, so <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, leave that tricky part to her and, and to anybody else who would like to weigh in. Perfect. I think we've kind of like the, the, the hour that we wanted to spend uh, on the uh, in the discussion is is almost over. But there, there would be one last question from the audience. Would you have time for for that? Sure. OK, great. Then uh, the last question that came from the audience goes like this. What do you think? Will the West find a unified approach to a ensuring that Iran will not build any nuclear weapons? and B, to find a truce in Israel. In Israel. I think the truce refers to the, yeah, to the, 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 current, uh, the current conflict and the current violence there. Uh, whoever wants to go first, Corey? Uh, I'll go first. Yes, I think the Biden administration is very much back in alignment with European perspectives on the Iran nuclear challenge. Um, I don't think there will be a problem having a unified Western position. I am skeptical we will anytime soon see a return to the Iranian nuclear agreement though, because in one of those perverse jokes of history, the nuclear agreement appears to have strengthened the hand of the most strident voices in Iranian politics. And if you look at the way their presidential election is shaping up for June, uh, it looks like we are going to get a harder line Iranian leadership. So that could make it difficult on the other side. Uh, and what was the second part of the question? Ah, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Israel and Palestine. Uh, in uh, the Middle East. Yeah. I, I don't actually see important distinctions between European government views on this and the American government view. I think... Um, it is possible at the same time to say uh, that the government of Israel displacing Palestinian Arabs uh, from their homes was what ignited this violence and should be stopped. The, to view as tragic the unraveling of multi-sectarian communities within Israel where Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis can now no longer live side by side in peace. Um, and to also say Hamas firing rockets into civilian neighborhoods is a terrible thing. And that Israel firing rockets into civilian neighborhoods is also a terrible thing. Um, the failures of leadership on both the Israeli and the Palestinian sides are a big part of this problem. And I actually wish the gov my government and European governments were doing a, putting a lot more pressure on the government of Israel and the, on the Palestinian leadership uh, to, to stop making civilians in both societies such victims. Elizabeth, you want to? One quick comment. Uh, so I think that the benefit of coming from a small country is that you don't assume that your country matters. And so you, 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 you try to see, well, you, you have to see the world through, uh, through the perspective of other countries as they fight out their various uh, disagreements. And I think the advantage of that is that you then um, proceed in life not seeing everything from, from your own perspective or from your country's perspective. And it's just a, an accident of, of, of the birth of those of us who come from small and, and insignificant countries. And I think it, 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 that matters greatly in, in uh, well, 
hopefully having that perspective matters greatly in international politics and, and diplomacy. And I think maybe that's, that's where, not maybe, surely that's where the Trump administration went wrong with Iran and, and multiple other issues that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't conceive of a perspective that wasn't theirs. And so as a result, they, uh, they made a, a terrible miscalculation, which is what Tori has highlighted. They undermined somebody who was actually relatively moderate and, and got, they, now we have somebody, uh, we are likely to have a regime that's less moderate as a result. So with that, over to you, Matthias. Perfect. Thank you so much to both of you. For me, it was a, it was a huge pleasure and yeah, time flew by very, very quickly. And um, yeah, I hope we can continue maybe this at some point. I don't know, at halftime for the Biden administration to see how things are going. <laughs> and um, yeah, so um, I just wanted to say um, thank you again, au revoir from Paris. And I want to hand over to Marcus who wants to do the final uh, farewell speech. Thank you. And thanks for the audience for uh, yeah, paying attention. I hope it was interesting for the audience as well. So thank you. Every one of you, um, this, this was a great event. I, I, I really enjoyed it and I had a great time and I learned a lot. And I'd like to uh, just quickly point out that we will continue this conversation on June the 22nd, where we will talk about power competition between uh, Europe, China and US uh, on uh, the question of innovation. And this will also be, uh, I think a very important topic. And I'd like to thank you, Corey and Elizabeth for this wonderful input uh, that you gave to us. And I'd like to wish everyone a great evening and a great afternoon in DC, I guess. So thanks everyone and have a great one.